share your name, how many years you've been at GHS, or branch, and the amount of time you serve. Speak up. So, you do. so Mr. Fisher, uh, Derek Fisher, this is my fifth year at GS, GHS. Uh, I was in the uh, Marines, and I was in for four years. Sam Young, this is my seventh year at GHS. I was in the Air Force, and I served 20 years. Scott Young, third year at GHS, um, Air Force, 22 years. Uh, Haggerty, first year at Greenwood. Um, I did four years, and they call that lifing. That's what that's called. Yeah. Lifing. <laughs> yeah. They're the crazy ones. Right. <laughs> Here are some questions that everyone can help with. Um, so why did you guys join the military? So, well, I was in fifth grade when 9-11 happened, and that was kind of a very formative time. You know, obviously it's, you know, a big thing and kind of just at that right age where it didn't kind of make sense, but it was something I realized I never wanted to see happen again. And that kind of always stuck there. And slowly I kind of realized I, as I got older, I didn't want to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And why not spend four years at least figuring out what I want to do and then go from there. I was from a little small town and I was the oldest of four kids and my parents could not afford to send me to college and I thought the military was on my way out. So I graduated high school, college did not work out. I worked a bunch of crappy jobs for a long time and for me it just was a, a way to get out of where I was, which at the time I was still here. So I went in under the four year plan and ended up doing the life Kind of the same reason uh, all together, didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't have money for college, uh, definitely wasn't mature enough to go to college, and it was a way out of the little town I was in, so. Um, I'm Mari, by the way. Um, what was your rank for your specialty? Uh, I got out as a corporal and my job uh, Sounds more complicated than it is. I was a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear defense specialist. So my job was if a, any of those attacks happened, train people how to react, respond, defend it against it. Uh, so basically teaching about that very specific topic. And that's kind of how I fell in love with teaching. I was uh, a master sergeant when I retired. Um, I worked in personnel, which was a lot of different jobs. I did everything from deploy people to different fields, to retirements, to assignments. Um, I mean, it has all kinds of various jobs. Um, when deployments happened, like 9-11, I was actually not... I was actually in the military in 9-11. I'm a lot older than Mr. Fisher. <laughs> we deployed people out, you know, and we sent them to different places. Um, so that was part of my job, was to send people out to those places to set up um, at um, various, you know, units and things. So I did jobs like that. And um, I had all kinds of different jobs within that same duty title, within that same career. So I retired as a senior master sergeant, and I had two different jobs, basically. I was, first job, I was uh, maintenance, and I did ground support for aircraft. So like when you're at the airport, and you see all the machines and everything hooked up to the planes. That was all the stuff we worked on back in the day. And then I cross-trained into logistics, and what we did, we called that beds, beans, and bullets, basically. So anytime, right? Anytime we forward deployed or had to redeploy to bring stuff back home, we, we planned the movement of all the people, the food, the stuff, the gear, the planes, the everything, to get them there, set them up, and then bring them home at the end of the deployment of the operation. 
I was a petty officer third class. Um, I was a builder, CV builder, and we built things. That was what we did. So my name is Ruby, and can you remember what the first day was like? <laughs> um, after basic training? Yes. Or basic training. Or basic training. Either. <laughs> Whichever one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first day, uh, long day, you leave six in the morning from uh, where I grew up uh, around Lima, Ohio. Uh, got in the car, eventually got on the plane, went down to South Carolina, got on a bus that felt like it was six seven hours, I don't know how long, it just kept getting darker and darker. And then one day, or one moment, they just, bus stops, they, somebody gets on, and the chaos begins. Uh, if you talk to Marines, they talk about staying on the yellow footprints. I was the first off of the bus, so my biggest fear was just standing on the footprints as hard as I could, and being a statue. And, yeah, that's when they started yelling at us, and it stayed that way for, I guess you could say three months, but I guess it never really stopped. <laughs> <laughs> that's about the truth. Uh, I got on my second plane ride ever in my life. Um, I flew out of West Virginia, which was the airport closest to me. I got on six different plane rides from there, San Antonio, Texas, which is where basic training was. I remember getting off my last plane ride and waiting and these guys in their blue uniforms came at me and was like, everybody line up and they were very strict and yelled at us and we had to walk in formation, which I didn't even know what that was at the time, after we got um, our bags and who knows why you pack because you don't get any of your stuff once you get to basic training because they issue you everything you're going to wear, including, well, for guys, your underwear. But um, you get nothing. They call you rainbows for a little while because you get to wear your civilian clothes until they issue you your military uniforms. And then it is horrible getting yelled at. And that's life for the next so many weeks. It wasn't quite three months for us. But yeah. No. <laughs> so you, you guys will laugh because it was Air Force, right? But we went to the map station. <laughs> downtown which is like the kind of in processing station and they put us in a limo to, to, <laughs> to go to the airport and everybody's super nice you know there's like eight of us in the limo and we're like what's going on we we flew down to san antonio and got off the plane and everybody's super nice yeah get on this bus over here and then at some point it got it was like two o'clock in the morning whenever we got on base and, and everybody's half asleep and it's it's pitch black and the door opens and they file you out into formation. And, and I can still remember, you know, just like, oh man, it's about ready to go down, right? And I remember looking through the window on this door and seeing this hat bobbing down the hallway. And he kicked the door open, and everybody was like, huh? And then it was on. It was just like, they just came out of the shadows. They were everywhere. I mean, they had those teeth, Smokey the Bear hats on. Over the one, like this, trying to provoke a reaction, and you're just like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. All the way up the fire escape, they were just on us, man. And, and I remember people like crying themselves asleep that night. I remember laying in the dorms and just hearing people. Now I was old, you know, so I wasn't old. And I'd been away from home, but there was people just sobbing. And I remember laying there going, man, this is the biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> yeah, that was the beginning. Basically the same. Uh, <laughs> except we were called Smurfs because they gave us blue outfits to wear until our uniforms came in. So they were blue sweatpants. So it, it was just degrading being called a smurf. Um, you're getting yelled at and then you're trying to understand what they're saying. Like formation, you don't know anything. They're teaching you that. And then they keep screaming, stop bopping, and you don't really know what they're even talking about. <laughs> and then finally, you start to figure this stuff out. But it, there's no one that's ever stopping and going, this is what we mean. Like, you just get screamed at until you figure it out. Yeah. That's the way it goes. Talk to that you served with? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, you make friends. You keep those friends. I mean, especially now that social media is a big thing, you just connect with them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a, a kid come in. Uh, he's a junior. He came in. He wants to go to the Air Force Academy, and I have a guy that I worked with at the very flat where we're retired out of, and he works at the Air Force Academy. So I shot him an email and said, "Can you help me?" And he's yeah. So yeah. One of my best friends uh, was my first supervisor, which was ugly back in the day. But we got over it. We got <laughs> Two of my best friends got me through some of the hardest times in my life and I got them through the hardest times in their life. I, uh, you know, I don't know, it might sound corny from the outside, but they are easily my brothers. They've been through more than I can ever even think that I've been through with my actual brothers. Don't tell them I said that. Um, but uh, both named Josh, that's I hope a coincidence, but yeah, there's nobody I trust more in this world. and. Anybody else who I don't talk to on a regular basis, like days like today, the Marine birthday, and I could strike up a conversation with them and it feels like zero time has passed. Mine, we had a core group and we went through A school together, went to battalion, same battalion, and then ended up all getting out and not re upping. And so we all stayed friends. We were in each other's weddings. We, I mean, like he said, I haven't talked to, one of them I talked to last month, one I haven't talked to in about six months, but if I called him up, it would be like no time to pass, so. Um, so I forgot to introduce myself before I started. I'm Willie. Um, uh, how, how did you stay in touch with your family and friends while you were in this? Kind of depends on where you're at. Uh, I don't know for you guys, but boot camp was nothing but handwritten letters, which is honestly pretty nice because I don't think a lot of us appreciate that slow writing is the best way to get out your emotions and actually think about the emotions before you say them. You know, some of the nastiest arguments I've had have been on the phone where I can say whatever I want as quick as I want. And I would have scared the crap out of my parents if I was calling them instead of writing them. And then uh, from there it was pretty much just Phone calls, texts, emails, all that fun stuff. Cell phones were not invented in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and I joined in 94. So, and when you go to basic training, you're not allowed to call for like the first two or three weeks. I mean, you just aren't allowed to talk to anybody. So you don't even get to make a phone call to your parents for a couple weeks. When you do, it's a, um, which don't exist anymore. But it was a, um, Call center, pay phone. Yeah, pay phone or call center, yeah. That you um, got like a five minute phone call or something like that and um, that was it. And you, it was long enough to say, hi, I'm fine. You know, who knows the next time I get to call you. After basic training, it's a little bit different. You go to, um, well, we call it tech school or AIT, whatever everybody else calls it. But um, it's a training where you get to learn what your job is, and it's a little bit different because there's phones maybe in your dorms or something where you can call every once in a while. Of course, when you get to your dormitories um, at a base you, you station that, you can have your own phone in your own room, um, and then you just call whenever. But again, back then, you were paying long-distance phone calls because you had a phone that was in your room. There was no cell phone. so. Letters, you sent cards, your parents did the same thing. Yeah. yeah, I remember basic. It was like, I think we sent like a form letter home. You remember that? Where it was like you just signed it, it was just something that said, Hey, your kid made it, he's safe, or she's safe, right? And that went. Um, and then we had the like the five minute pay phone call. Um, and if no one answered, they missed your call. That was it. <laughs> Um, other than that, it was pretty easy, like she said, no cell phones. Uh, being deployed was a little bit tough sometimes, especially before, depending where you were, before cell phones. Um, like there was call centers, and, and you kind of had to time um, uh, where you were in the world versus where your family was in the world, right? So you had to plan all that stuff out. You might be calling home at Tuesday at 4 o'clock in the morning your time just to try to get them after school or something like that. So there were challenges, but, you know. And then the longer you're in, like 
when I was stationed at various places, we wouldn't have a way to call at all uh, because it's before cell phones. Yeah. And you just you're kind of used to that. Like it doesn't really you're just doing what you have to do. Yeah. You know? yeah. It was back in that time too. It was like people weren't connected 24 seven. Right. Right. So right. it was like it was okay if you didn't talk to someone for two weeks. Right. <laughs> we're gonna have Mari. Sorry to interrupt. I'm gonna have Mari and uh, ask one more question. Um, and then Ruby, and then Jackie's and Megan will wrap up for us. Okay. Um, so transitioning back to civilian life, getting out of the army, what was that like? Glorious. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> oh, it's a very hard experience. I don't think you ever truly fully transition. There's a lot of things that people do that just kind of get on your nerves because you're like, why don't, why doesn't everybody on the same page about this small insignificant thing that only I seemingly care about, but going to college where you have complete freedom and, you know, trying to maintain that and uh, work with a bunch of people and that was probably a good experience for me was going to college so I could have, you know, that ability to learn before I had to try and figure that out with a, you know, regular job. Um, I went from high school directly into the military, and then I spent 20 years. Mine was a very structured life, and I was die-hard military. He'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very much this is the way it's got to be controlled, if that makes sense. So when I retired, I was ready to retire, don't get wrong, don't get me wrong, but um, it was a big transition for me. Um, I went straight from military lifestyle to college to get my master's degree, and I did a lot of volunteer stuff. I had to stay busy, I always had to do something. Um, he got a promotion and got an assignment and so we moved and it was great because we moved to Hawaii which was awesome and we took our kids with us and um, so I got to experience you know life as a civilian in an island which was amazing <laughs> so I think that what but it was a big change for me at the same time um, because then I became a dependent and in the military world becoming a female dependent is a hard transition because you're number one when people see you anyway as a military couple they automatically assume that he's the military member which really I'll be honest with you makes me very very angry I mean you can't imagine how angry it makes me because I did two years in the military and I'm like are you kidding me that you didn't assume that it was me who was the military person uh, and I get that asked every single time like, oh, your husband was in the military, blah, blah, blah. I was like, mm. So um, then I became a dependent, and it was like, oh, my God. No, I'm the retiree. <laughs> so to this day, I still get it, and it makes, it fires me up. So um, even, you know, what it, I've been retired eight years now, and so it was a very hard transition for me. Um, but... Yeah, that's the hardest part for me. That was the hardest part, I think, because one, I'm a female, and um, two, I was I retired first, so I did experience that dependent status, and it was very difficult for me to do that. But coming in and, and having this job, it's been a different experience for me, and I really like it, so I love what I do right now. Yeah. So my transition was awesome. And I can say because I was retiring, uh, and there's a lot of support for. I, I can't speak for the four-year guys. It's probably a little different. Is that the bell already? Oh, you guys sorry. Can, no, you two yeah. finish up so your comments. It helped that she was already retired because we kind of had one foot out the door, right? We kind of knew how it was going to go. Um, and for me, I was so ready to retire when the time came, and I just didn't even look back. I was gone. So it was awesome. Mine was. On the inside, I thought it was going to be so great getting out, and then I got out and I realized it wasn't so great. Uh, and then there's so many things like in construction, which is what I did as a builder, 
in the military you call everything by a specific vocabulary and then you get out and you go onto a job site and that vocabulary doesn't work out here in this world and they're looking at you like you're stupid and you're going I'm not stupid that's just like what we called it and it was just a lot of getting used to Thank you for your time and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate you.